So Hosea chapter 9 in Church Bibles is on page 877. Now, we always have to ask the question, why is this particular passage in the Bible? It's a fair question to ask every time we come to any passage. So why is Hosea chapter 9 in the Bible? It will teach us what we already know, that all God's, all God's punishments are well earned. But he will teach us perhaps what we don't already know, that God's punishments fit the crime. So that really is the theme of chapter 9. So all God's punishments are well earned. Hosea has made that point a hundred times now and he'll make it again. But God's punishments fit the crime. The passage divides into four paragraphs. And what I intend to do this evening is read a paragraph and then say a few words about it and then do the same again four times and maybe we'll have some questions at the end. So we're in Hosea chapter 9 and verse 1. First of all, verses 1 to 6. Do not rejoice, O Israel, with joy like other peoples, for you have played the harlot against your God. You have loved for reward on every threshing floor. The threshing floor and the wine press shall not feed them, and the new wine shall fail in her. They shall not dwell in the Lord's land. But Ephraim shall return to Egypt and shall eat unclean things in Assyria. They shall not offer wine offerings to the Lord, nor shall their sacrifices be pleasing to him. It shall be like bread of mourners to them. All who eat it shall be defiled. For their bread it shall be for their life. It shall not come into the house of the Lord. What will you do in the appointed day and in the day of the feast of the Lord? For indeed they are gone because of destruction. Egypt shall gather them up. Memphis shall bury them. Nettles shall possess their valuables of silver. Thorns shall be in their tents. Well, what Hosea is telling us there is that you can actually be religious and be, un and be under judgment. Unconverted people don't actually believe that. They just do not believe that you can be religious and under judgment, even if they believe in judgment at all. But Hosea has stressed that already and it's quite clear again. Um, Israel, this northern kingdom, is a very rel religious group of people. But there is this one great thing which is missing. Remember the analogy between husband and wife. And what's missing is this loyalty which the wife must have to her husband. The husband is God, the wife is Ephraim, the wife is Israel. So there's this great loyalty which is missing. And you'll see it there in verses 1 and 2. Israel has played the prostitute, has played the harlot. There's all these threshing floors where all this cult prostitution has gone on. And that harlotry, we should remember, is used of us in the New Testament. Listen to James. Adulterers and adulteresses. Strong language, isn't it? Do you not know that friendship with the world is enmity with God? Whoever therefore wants to be a friend of the world makes himself an enemy of God. So we're not tempted by Canaanite fertility religions. That's not our problem. The New Testament problem nonetheless is conformity to the world, taking on the values of the surrounding people, thinking what's great is what they say is great, thinking what's low in scale is what they say is low in scale and really just becoming like the peoples of the world. Be not conformed to this world, says the New Testament. And they were being conformed to the world by being conformed to the Canaanite religion. And their judgment will be fitting. Let's think of Israel. It's guilty of flirting, political flirting. One minute it's running up to Assyria for a little bit of help. And then the next minute it's running down to Egypt for a little bit of help. And the punishment will fit the crime. Verse 3, they shall not dwell in the Lord's land, but Ephraim shall return to Egypt and shall eat unclean things in Assyria. So instead of these supposed allies being their friends, in fact they will be their oppressors. To the point where we read in verse 6, 
indeed they are gone because of destruction, Egypt shall gather them up, Memphis, an Egyptian city, shall bury them. So for their political flirtation, their actual the people with whom they've committed political harlotry will of course be the means of their destruction. And what about their religious flirtation? They went to this God and they went to this God and they went to this God all the time while they named Jehovah as well as their God. Well, verse 2. The threshing floor and the wine press shall not feed them and the new wine shall fail in her. So you go to, why do you go to a, a fertility cult? Well, so that you'll have a good harvest. And that's exactly what you won't have. Verse 4. They shall not offer wine offerings to the Lord, nor shall their sacrifices be pleasing to them. It shall be like bread of mourners to them. All who eat it shall be defiled, for their bread shall be for their life. It shall not come into the house of the Lord. The day is coming when they just have enough bread to eat, to stay alive, just enough. They certainly won't have any bread uh, for offerings. So this fertility cult will actually ruin them. It will do exactly the opposite of what it is ten intended. And then what will become of all their religious festivals? Verses 5 and 6. So God is exactly fitting the punishment to meet the crime. Flirt with worldly allies, God will crush you by them. Flirt with supposed gods, and I will give you exactly the opposite of what they promise. That's the way that God will deal with this nation, which is so far gone into its spiritual apostasy. Now we go to verse 7 and 8 and 9. Let me read. The days of punishment have come. The days of recompense have come. Israel knows. The prophet is a fool. The spiritual man is insane. Because of the greatness of your iniquity and great enmity, the watchman of Ephraim is with my God. But the prophet is a fowler's snare in all his ways, and enmity in the house of his God. They are deeply corrupted as in the days of Gibeah. He will remember their iniquity. He will punish their sins. Uh, again, this is not one of these tender chapters of Hosea. Uh, the punishment is on the way to the point where we can say that it has come, and they know it. Uh, Paul tells us, doesn't he, in Romans chapter 1, that although people commit foul sins day after day, every sin in the catalogue, they know that there is a judgment for them. They know it. And Israel knew, despite everything that it did, that the judgment had come. Why? Well, there's a new sin fastened on here, which has not been mentioned before in the book. You'll find it in the second half of verse 7 and verse 8. Here is a prophet who stands up to speak in God's name. What is the public estimate of him? He's a, he's a fool. And here is a spiritual man who is seeking God, cultivating his spiritual life, loves the Lord with all his heart and soul and mind and strength. What's the people's estimate of him? Verse 7. He's insane. He's lost it. So that shows, says Hosea, verse 7, how great your iniquity is. When you believe that a man of God is crackers, and when you believe that someone who brings God's word is a fool, the only explanation for that is, of course, the greatness of your crime. And Jeremiah had to put up with that. Uh, there was a letter, of course, as you may remember if you've read Jeremiah, which actually suggested that he and people like him they should be clamped in the stocks with iron collars around their necks just to stop them prophesying. Uh, they were distinctly called fools or madmen. That's how the unconverted people, these spiritually apostate people, see God's spokesman. But how does God see them? Verse 8. God sees such men as the watchmen, of whom we read a great deal in Ezekiel, of course. These are the men who stand on the, war, on the, on the tower, and they, they cry out the warning 
and they plead with the city to listen. That's how God sees them, but that's not how they see them. Look at verse 8. They see the prophet either as a fowler's snare, which is one translation, or as someone to be snared, which is another translation. They both suggest, nonetheless, this tremendous enmity and tension between the people and God's spokesman. And they're out to get him. Even in the house of his God, there is enmity. So they're not liking God. They obviously don't like the people who bring them the word of God. And so we get to verse 9. They are deeply corrupted as in the days of Gibeah. I hope you've all read the Bible through. Uh, If you have, then perhaps you were as shocked as I was when I first read the Bible through and came to Judges chapters 19, 20 and 21, which all the Bible stories I'd been told as a child never told me those stories about the tremendous homosexual lust in Gibeah and the murder by rape of a woman in Gibeah and all the trouble that that led to and the civil war which followed and the near destruction of the tribe of Benjamin and Gibeah there stands in history as a picture of shame and godlessness and overt immorality unashamed immorality and now the prophet is standing in front of Israel and saying that they are deeply corrupted as in the days of Gibeah. History is repeating itself. They are as far gone as that. And then he says this shocking thing. Verse 9, you'll see why it's shocking in a moment. He will remember their iniquity. He will punish their sins. Now, if you have that, just keep that passage in mind and listen to this one from from Jeremiah. No more shall every man teach his neighbor and every man his brother, saying, Know the Lord. For they shall all know me, from the least of them to the greatest of them, says the Lord. For I will forgive their iniquity (coughs) and their sin I will remember no more. So Jeremiah, when he speaks of Christ and the coming new covenant, He speaks in God's name, I will forgive their iniquity. Hosea says, he will remember their iniquity. Jeremiah, speaking of Christ, says, and their sin I will remember no more. Hosea says, he will punish their sins. This is a lost nation. And it's a lost nation because of its crimes against God and his law. So we stay now in Hosea chapter 9 and we go now to verse 10. I found Israel like grapes in the wilderness. I saw your fathers as the first fruits on the fig tree in its first season. But they went to Baal Peor and separated themselves to that shame. They became an abomination like the thing they loved. As for Ephraim, their glory shall fly away like a bird. No birth, no pregnancy, and no conception. Though they bring up their children, yet I will bereave them to the last man. Yes, woe to them when I depart from them. Just as I saw Ephraim like Tyre planted in a pleasant place, (coughs) so Ephraim will bring out his children to the murderer. Give them, O Lord, But what will you give? Give them a miscarrying womb and dry breasts. Now there's very vivid pictures here. A man is in the wilderness, verse 10. He's out in the desert. He's hungry and thirsty and discouraged. And then he comes across, of all things in the wilderness, some grapes. Well, you can just perhaps just begin to imagine some of the emotion he felt and some of the delight. That's how God is described when he first takes Israel to be his. Verse 10. Or a man has a fig tree and he plants it 
And as you know, there are early figs and late figs, but sometimes for many seasons there aren't any figs. But on the very first season, the fig tree produces a fig. He's as pleased as punch, it's like any of you have planted an apple tree or a peach tree, and there it is, the very first apple, maybe the only one that year, the very first peach. And there's this, mix, there's this pleasure and delight. Look what I found, and it's mine. That's what's said about God when he first took Israel to be his. But, verse 10, they went to Baal Peor. After Balaam, as you remember, this nation which had been saved out of Egypt and preserved through the wilderness committed adultery spiritually and physically at Baal Peor. They adopted the Canaanite religion and took Canaanites for partners. And that led to that terrible judgment there on the very borders of the promised land. And that's been the history ever since. Instead of glory, shame. Therefore the glory will depart. Verse 11 now, what is the glory of Israel? Why, well, it's the presence of God. It'll depart. And there it is again in verse 12. Yes, woe to them when I depart from them. A terrible judgment here. Once more, the very opposite of, of fertility rites. No birth. This is verse 11. Why not? No pregnancy. But why not? No conception. Some people have children, but they will all be bereaved to the last man. Every family will have a bereavement. Such a pleasant place, Israel. Verse 13. Just lovely to look at. Pleasant to the eye, just like Tyre down there by the seaside. What a pleasant place. But you'll bring out your children to the murderer. Talking, of course, of the invading army. So instead of fertility, ruin. Instead of peace, warfare. Instead of security, carnage. And why? Always the same reason. Why? Because of sin. So we go to verse 15. All their wickedness is in Gilgal. For there I hated them because of the evil of their deeds. I will drive them from my house. I will love them no more. All their princes are rebellious. Ephraim is stricken. Their root is dried up. They shall bear no fruit. Yes, were they to bear children, I would kill the beloved fruit of their womb. My God will cast them away because they did not obey him and they shall be wanderers among the nations. Tremendously strong language. But this is what I said at the beginning of this series and several times since. Hosea is sometimes very tender. Sometimes the backslider is left to burn his fingers. And sometimes there's language so stern that we're still surprised after many years of the Christian life to find such severity on the pages of the Word of God. And this is an example of it. Gilgal. Now Gilgal was a wonderful memory in Israel. When they'd come through that wilderness and Baal Peor was over and they crossed the Jordan, where did they set their foot? What was the first foothold in the Promised Land? Well, it was Gilgal. Where was the very first Passover celebrated in the Promised Land? Well, it was in Gilgal. Where did Saul's coronation take place? There. And when David eventually came back from exile, where was he welcomed? Well, there. I mean, there's so much joy associated with the place. But you see, you can have a good history. But so what? Gilgal now stinks in God's nostrils because all the sins of the nations are found in that one sore spot. There it is. There's a great boil bursting on Israel's skin and it's Gilgal. All the foulness is coming out there, in that very place. So this language of verse 15 is very strong, don't you agree? But it's the language which is all the way through Hosea, of this marriage relationship, but now it's coming to nothing. And now 
the wife is being expelled in this particular case. It's the wife that's being expelled because of her terrible, terrible misdeeds and adultery. And that's why that language is used there in verse 15. So the history of Israel in the future, says Hosea, will be estrangement, verse 15 and verse 17. And it will be barrenness, verse 16. And it will be homelessness, verse 17. And what lies at the root of it all, verse 17. Because they did not obey him. That's where Hosea leaves it, but that's not actually where we should leave it. As we study the word of God, we come across the law of opposites. When God, for example, says, you shall not steal, he doesn't mean that if you don't steal, that's enough. He means that you should use your goods for the good of others. When God says, you shall not lie, what he basically means, of course, is that you must always encourage and promote the truth. Always the law of opposites in scripture. When he says, remember the Sabbath day, of course, he means you will not desecrate it. Now, that applies in prophecy as well. Why did all this happen? Verse 17. Because they did not obey him. But is that all that God wants us to learn? If you don't obey, there will be chaos and ruin and terror. Is that all God wants us to know? Well, obviously not. Not by the law of opposites. He wants us to know that if we do obey, then of course there will be blessing and favor and everything that we need. We shall enjoy God. If sin drives away God's presence, then obedience will bring it. <coughs> if sin causes ruin, then obedience will cause blessing. If sin causes God to cast you off, then obedience will cause you to embrace him. So although it is a terrible indictment and judgment, but the lesson that we have to learn is not just the folly of disobedience, but the glory and blessing of obedience. Without, of course, falling into salvation by works. But Hosea won't let us fall into that. Again and again he's reminded Hosea that the very fact that they've been named as God's people at all is because of God's grace. But God's blessings nonetheless come to the obedient heart. So my heart is not just saying to me as I read such a chapter, if I sin, I'm in for it. That's all we learn. We haven't learned very much. But if I can also learn, if I set myself actively to please God by obeying his revealed will, then I'm in for blessing.